audience came back, we can officially start and people will jump in um, during the lecture if they're late. So uh, good day to everyone. Welcome to our fourth Belgrade Legal Theory Group event uh, in this year. Uh, my name is Sava Vojnovic and um, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Dan Friel from Oscud uh, Hall Law School, York University, uh, who is going to talk about ways of explaining law. Uh, we could call it also a part of the mentioned continuation of series of lectures on the naturalization of law or legal theory, or uh, in this case, we're going to talk about uh, legal philosophy. Uh, as you all know, the presentation should last no longer than 30 minutes, and afterwards comes the Q&A part. Um, you can raise your virtual hand for uh, making a comment or asking the question. Uh, and without further ado, Dan, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, I apologize for this delay. So the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Sava, for inviting me, and thanks everyone for coming. And I apologize for this uh, time difference misunderstanding, but I'm glad that we're all here. I only have half an hour and I have uh, a lot to say, so uh, let's jump right in. So um, so the piece I sent you is a review that's I'm still, it's still unfinished of Jules Dixon's uh, book published last year, Elucidating Law. Um, and I, I wanna say that in some respects, the review or the book to me is, is less important than as an example for a wider phenomenon that, that I think is worth uh, talking about. Um, and it's a phenomenon I've written about this before, but, but the book for me is, is an illustration of, of the persistence of this problem, which is the problem that I call um, the isolation of legal philosophy. Now I should say, maybe things are different uh, in, in Europe, my sense is that uh, perhaps uh, because, for example, legal philosophy or jurisprudence is a compulsory course in um, in Europe or Latin America, things are somewhat different there than in the English speaking world where typically it's not. But at least in the English speaking world, my sense is that uh, legal philosophy is isolated both from other uh, from the rest of legal academia. It sort of seems to engage in questions that others finding pu find puzzling and uninteresting, but also, and this is actually the part that I'm more interested in the talk today, um, from other branches of philosophy. And, and, and it, I think it complements my earlier previous discussions on the first issue of the isolation of legal philosophy from other the rest of legal academia, because people sometimes say, Leslie Green, for example, says, oh, the reason why uh, other legal academics are kind of lost interest in legal philosophy. It's become too complicated, too specialized. And I've never bought this in part because I thought um, legal philosophy is not that complicated, but more importantly, because I thought, well, in that case, um, legal philosophy should have been a topic of interest for other philosophers. And that seems to me to be um, not happening as well. And so, so that's why I'm, I'm today focusing more on this isolation of legal philosophy from the rest of philosophy. So this is not part of my paper and I have to say it's a bit speculative. So I'm going to give you a little bit of speculative history, so to speak, as to why it happened. And my thought is this, when legal philosophy kind of became this professionalized domain, uh, which is actually much later than most people think, it's really started around the 1950s, um, it faced, um, and again, I'm not by, by this, I'm not suggesting there was no legal philosophy before that, of course not. But this sort of conception of legal philosophy as, as, a, as a branch of philosophy with a self identity, um, it sort of faced in possible encroachments from two directions. One is from all other interdisciplinary approaches to law. So what I call broadly speaking, empirical study of law, sociology, history, comparative law, psychology, you name it. And on the other side, there was also the possible encroachment of, of legal philosophy from other branches of, of philosophy, specifically, especially political philosophy. And so I suggest that what is law understood as a, as a question about what law must be, about the necessary and sufficient criteria for something to be law, is kind of an, a, a way out or a solution to this challenge. Because this is a question that sort of guarantees that law will not be encroached from either 
empirical study. That's not an empirical question. It's not presented as an empirical question, but also not from political philosophy, because this is perceived as a conceptual question, not as a political question. But um, it turns out that even this attempt at escaping or finding this little domain that's free from intervention, uh, that's pure legal philosophy, uh, has not really succeeded. And that's my, or at least that's my claim to you, uh, because once that question was started, people started engaging with this question, all kinds of methodological questions started to arise. And these methodological questions raise a lot of questions or, or address or touched on many issues that were in fact relevant or touched upon by philosophers in other areas of philosophy, especially philosophy of science, philosophy of social science, philosophy of explanation, even philosophy of mind and action. And so my aim in this, in, in my review and in the talk is to highlight some of those philosophical questions that contemporary legal philosophy uh, ignores um, because of its isolation from the rest of philosophy. I want to just kind of, you know, plug my own work. So if you're interested in sort of looking at the legal aspects or the, the sort of the empirical study of law that's been ignored, uh, there's a paper of mine called Evidence-Based Jurisprudence published in 2019, and there I talk about some of those. Okay, so now I'm actually getting to the paper, and I started with a point in which, on which I agree with Julie Dixon. She says, law is a human-made social institution. Fair enough, and seems obvious enough that you could find no reason to object to this, to this claim. Who could object to this? Well, I say, but if you accept this, that poses or, or a dilemma. And that's a dilemma that I think many legal philosophers uh, and definitely Julie Dixon in her book do not address. So, and here's the dilemma. Either you say, Law is just like any other human-made social institution, in which case it's not obvious that there should be a unique philosophy of legal philosophy, which is what Dixon claims her book to be about. Sure, there are questions in the philosophy of social science or philosophy of explanation that are relevant to the, expo to the explanation of social institutions, but it's not obvious at all uh, why there should be special philosophy of legal philosophy rather than philosophy of social explanation or philosophy of social science. So the challenge on this horn of the dilemma is in what methodological ways law is different from marriage, family, market, socialism, capitalism, money, democracy, religion. You can add as many social institutions as you want, all of which have been studied by many scholars from very diff many different perspectives, but no one seems to think that there is a philosophy of uh, marriage that is asked unique questions about the methodology of this inquiry. So that's one option. The other option to, the, to avoid this troubling uh, conclusion, you'd say, okay, law in fact is a unique social institution such so unique that it raises unique questions of explanation. Meaning in other, words, in other words, that there is something unique about law that makes the forms of explanation that fit or that are appropriate for understanding marriage, family, market, socialism, capitalism, and so on, inappropriate for explaining law. But if that's the option that you take, or if that's the line that you take, then first of all, I would say, what are those unique features? There's no discussion of that that I'm familiar with. Um, there's also, if you want, a further question, which is, um, how do you know that before you're embarking on encounter of the nature of law? But let's leave that aside, the sort of the circularity or, or question, or, uh, but simply say, what are those features? Now, of course, law is in some respects unique, just like marriage is in some respects unique, but that does not imply that there is anything about the methods of explaining it that are unique, right? And if that's the case, then this raises the question of why should there be a philosophy of legal philosophy rather than just philosophy of social explanation? 
I want to say is that this, again, is not in my paper, but just to show that this touches not just on methodological questions, but also on substantive ones. So Andrew Marmer, in a, an article published not long ago, has argued legal positivism is a view or an argument about the ontology alone, specifically a climate, a climate reduction. Um, I, I'm not sure reduction of what to what, but, but never mind. Uh, in any case, I don't think, as it happens, that it's true of the legal positivism of Kelts and Raz and even Hart. But let's leave that exegetical point aside. Um, once again, you may ask, why is this unique question about law? Why is this not a question? Why is the question of explaining law in this, the, the, or, or the reduction of law, unique to law and, and different from the kind of question that you may ask about language, religion, games, and so on, all, all our human institutions that have normative aspect to them and that you may wonder how we explain the, their normativity um, in a, without kind of invoking metaphysically uh, extravagant ideas, right? So, so once again, I'm saying this issue, this dilemma in a, in a way uh, is exactly the same also or, or raises itself also in substantive questions, not just methodology. Okay. And so... I say this myth, this dilemma is quite, to me, obvious, and yet it's not addressed. Julie Dixon writes a 200-page book and never really touches on this question, and I don't see it in, uh, addressed by others. So why is that? Well, my claim is that legal philosophy has isolated itself also from the rest of philosophy, and here are some of the questions that we're that do arise. That if you look at these issues, uh, from the perspective of other philosophical areas. So um, what does it actually mean to explain the concept of law, the nature of law, the character of law? What is, does it mean to, uh, to discuss, to claim that philosophy has priority over other inquiries? And uh, what, is it, what is the sense in which um, Hart said of his approach that it is not just analytic jurisprudence, but also um, descriptive sociology. And if we think of jurisprudence as one form of explanation of law, how, how does it relate to other methods of explanation? So all these are the, the questions that I'll at least try to touch upon in this talk. So first question. Um, so, and, and here I present, uh, I, I said we talk a lot in law about the concept of law, the nature of law, the character of law. And I argue that this talk is confused by, uh, confuses two quite different understandings of concept or nature. Uh, one is this, uh, the idea of concepts as, as abstract objects, and the other is concepts as mental representations. Um, and this is a, a something that philosophers who have been discussing concepts and conceptual analysis have noticed this is not a point original to me. Uh, and again, it's sort of, it's ignored because there is no attention to these debates in philosophy. So what is, but I want to say that this, this distinction does have implications or, or, or helps us understand debates within legal philosophy. So the understanding of concepts as abstract objects, I say, is the best understanding of Kelsen's work. And here uh, in this paper and also in some other work that's not published, I, I kind of trace uh, Kelsen's work to the intellectual context in which he's writing neo-Kantian anti-psychologism of the late 19th century, early 20th century uh, in German legal philosophy. Uh, Frege is, is one uh, important represent, perhaps the most important uh, philosopher who is engaging with this project. Um, but perhaps more relevant to Kelsen is the work of Herman Cohen. Um, and, um, and this is, okay, there's a mistake. So, sorry, this is a mistake in the slide. Uh, and I argue also that um, if you want to see how these ideas come into English language jurisprudence, so Raz in the 1970s is a Kelsenian. And he's clearly not thinking then about concepts as mental representations. He clearly adopts the Kelsenian view, including this idea that uh, philosophy has priority over uh, empirical work. He explicitly says, uh, I accept Kelsen's idea that philosophy has priority over empirical work on law. 
Interestingly, and that's kind of uh, beside my point, but I think it's worth noting that um, in recent years, there has been a project of what I call the calcinification of heart. Um, work by John Gardner, Leslie Green, uh, and a few others have uh, that attempt to say, oh, when, when Hart says he's doing descriptive sociology, he didn't quite mean what he said, and purports to show that actually he was a good Kelsenian. I think that as a matter of exegesis, that's not true. True, but I think that's an interesting uh, observation about the sort of recent de developments and debates. Now, this view and only this view implies the priority or independence of philosophy uh, over other branches of over empirical studies, which was a view that Kelsen explicitly adopted, which is a view that Raz explicitly adopted. On the other side, you you have this idea of concepts of multiple mel representations. And here we have Hart's ordinary language philosophy, uh, and he's not alone. Uh, J.L. Austin, who Hart always said was his biggest philosophical inspiration, was doing the same thing, and other ordinary legal uh, ordinary legal philosoph uh, language philosophers did the same thing. Interestingly, I think that in the 1980s, Raz sort of moves in that direction, and Raz becomes more impressed by this idea that uh, jurisprudence is a hermeneutic uh, enterprise and hermeneutic is a form of sociological enterprise. He says at one point, for example, right, when we explain law, we're explaining something that people use to understand themselves. That's a clearly hermeneutic statement. But, it, and, and significantly, really, this is, this is a very, very important point to understanding the landscape of legal philosophy this view implies that there is no priority of philosophy. Philosophy in a way is then seen as good sociology. And this is important because the, failing to take this distinction, to understand this distinction uh, leads to confusion. And Dixon book in this respect is an example of this confusion because she switches. She at times adopts this priority of philosophy view, and at times adopts the idea that philosophy, that jurisprudence is in the business of elucidating people's self-understandings. These are two completely different projects, or so I argue. Okay, so now let's think, let's look at the first branch, the Kelsinian approach. And so Green, as, as I told you that, I said to you that, that he uh, is in the business of calcinifying heart. If you want the introduction to the third edition of the concept of law, is, is a clear example of that project. So he says something that sounds very sensible. Before anyone starts counting anything, before, meaning before you start doing any empirical work, we need to know what counts as what. There's no counting without counting as. Right? Sounds simple, sounds obvious. How can you know what you talk about anything without knowing what you're talking about? And this is not even a new idea. So Cicero says, you know, more than 2000 years ago, we'll never be able to understand what sort of thing we're talking about unless we understand first just what it is. And Dixon, both in her book and in the early articles, advocates this idea of stage inquiry. And this idea makes sense only if you think of concepts as abstract objects, kind of neoplatonist Platonist view. Um, and as I said, this idea sounds very simple, very obvious. Who could object to, to this? Except that when you start looking at it, we see everywhere social concepts that we don't explain in this way. You don't see in debates on democracy, people saying, oh, first we need to understand as a conceptual matter, as a non-political matter, what democracy is. And then we, we, we get to the, the question of whether democracy is a good thing or not. No, if anything, the, the direction of the argument goes in the opposite direction. We first say what democracy is for, and from this we derive a view about what democracy is. Marriage is, is a particularly good example for me because the question has been debated in recent years, not just by philosophers, or not at all by philosophers. Um, and, and again, you have debates about that sometimes are framed as what is marriage, but they, no one says, oh, what is marriage precedes or it's a conceptual inquiry. Even those who argue against same-sex marriage or those who argue in favor of same-sex marriage don't frame these, their claims as a purely conceptual argument. 
And perhaps a better example for me is science, because if you want, you, can, you might say philosophy of science, philosophy of law are kind of an in philosophical reflection or observation on a, a human institution, right? Science is also a human institution. And here I have a quote from uh, an introductory book on, on philosophy of science. If we want to understand how science works, it seems that the first thing we need to do is work out what exactly we're trying to explain. Exactly this view. Where does science begin and end? Which kind of activity counts as science? Unfortunately, this is not something we can settle in advance. There's a lot of disagreement what counts as science, and these disagreements are connected to all other issues discussed in this book. Now, to be absolutely clear, I'm not saying, well, Peter Godfrey Smith, who is a philo famous philosopher of science, says, says so, so obviously he's right. It's absolutely possible that he's wrong. But my point is that at least this shows us that what seemed like a so such an obvious idea that we first start with saying what law is and only then turn to talking about what makes it good is not so obvious. And to the extent that Godfrey Smith reflects or represents in, this, in, these, in, this, in these words, views that are widely accepted by philosophers of science, and I think he does, then it suggests that this view is not some crazy unique view, but actually the standard view among philosophers of science. So once again, I'm not, maybe they're all wrong, but I'm saying you need to do a bit more than just saying, well, before you start do, uh, counting, you need to do to count to find out what counts as. You need to work a little bit harder than, than that. Okay, so that's the first branch. What about the alternative? Um, elucidation. Um, and this is the Hartian approach, which I argue is an anti-naturalistic understanding. First in, uh, to, to use the German idea, it's a kind of sociology, and this is not me saying this. This is Hart saying this. Hart calls his book descriptive sociology, and I think he absolutely meant what he said. Um, and he was an ordinary language philosopher, and he gave uh, explained his project in a manner very similar to the way other ordinary language philosophers at Oxford explained their project at the time. Um, and I say ordinary language philosophy is sociological in nature because it seeks, and this is what ordinary language philosophers, including Hart, explicitly say. They're saying we are trying to make explicit the rules underlying our linguistic usage. So we are trying to bring out what's already implicit. And the point of this is, of course, not just to understand language, as Hart says, but to understand the social world that we create with language. And so in this respect, you can think of language as a kind of data for sociology. And here is an example, just me showing that uh, what Hart is doing is exactly in line with other uh, philosophers at Oxford or ordinary language philosophers are doing at this time. So Gilbert Ryle, the concept of mind, many people can talk sense uh, with concepts, cannot talk sense about them. They know by practice how to operate with concepts anyhow inside familiar fields, but they cannot state the logical regulations governing the use. They're like people who know their way about their own parish, but cannot construct or read a map of it, much less a map of the region or continent in which their parish lies. And I'm not going to read hard, but this is exactly down to the example or the metaphor that he uses what Hart says. Right? It's, it's like someone's familiar with town but cannot uh, and can get from one place to another but cannot read a map of it. Okay, now sociology, that's perfectly fine, a good project. We want to understand what law is in order to understand people's social lives, the world that people created. But if that's the case, that raises a lot of, again, philosophical questions that were discussed by philosophers of social science. How good is the sociological method? One question is, where is the evidence? Daniel Dennett called this kind of project auto-anthropology. You reflect about yourself, you kind of do anthropology with yourself as a subject. But notice also it's a sociology with a subject of one. Um, and now, I'm not saying it's useless, but it definitely raises questions about how the project is done. It obviously raises questions of bias, not in the sense that the philosopher here is using themselves for their own conclusions. 
then of course there's a question of the possibility of missing diverse views among different people. Um, and here I say philosophers are people too. So it's sometimes intriguing, interesting to say to see people say, "Oh, this is what people think about law." When we know that this is not what all people think about law, because philosophers are people too. When they're reflecting their views, they're not just observing, they're also bringing out their self-understandings of law. Now, maybe Dworkin's views are completely unrepresentative, but that's a que an empirical question to, to measure. And of course, that also raises the, the possibility, which again is discussed in philosophical literature, of this the, the idea that uh, these human concepts can change because people's practices can affect and people's ideas about those practices can change those concepts. And so once again, all these issues are um, ignored by legal philosophers because they don't look beyond legal philosophy. To give you a specific example of missing out this reflexivity idea, you see both Dixon and Brian Leiter are saying, um, people who argue in a particular about kind of sometimes confuse what they want law to be with what law is. It's wishful thinking. But maybe they're not wishfully thinking. They are arguing about changing the concept of law, which is exactly what a reflexive or interactive concept, uh, like, a, like all human-related social concepts are, or many human-related social concepts are. Um, that's what they are. They're constantly changing through arguments about what they should be. Um, and, and now and this is a part of my paper that is not developed. So uh, once you see that we're talking about just a form of social explanation, an explanation of social phenomenon, then the uh, elucidation, this, the approach that says, let's look at linguistic practices as a means for understanding those social practices is just one way, maybe good or maybe bad, but just one way of explaining law. Um, and then um, we have the option of saying there are other ways which may be superior. Um, maybe um, the thought that philosophy here is it has some kind of primacy or primacy over other approaches is what makes us uh, think of other perspectives as um, secondary. We first do legal philosophy, and then you know law and economics can come in, then sociology can come in. But no, if we think of this as a social, as a kind of sociological enterprise, then uh, other approaches are possible uh, and need to be considered as equal or as competitors for the, um, socio the sociological approach that Hart advocated. I have one more slide, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, but maybe it will arise in conclusion. I want to suggest, and I'll close with that, that maybe uh, a better way of understanding this um, debate that we're having is between naturalist and anti-naturalist. And all the anti-naturalists are essentially interpretivists which means all are actually Dworkinian. And so, uh, so in the end, the result is that, and this is at least my thought, uh, Dworkin uh, was right to say that the best, the only way of understanding the other, heart, the other legal philosophers who are doing a kind of sociological work are actually um, engaging in the kind of enterprise that he was uh, uh, doing. I'll stop here. If, there, if you want to hear more about this last thought, I'm, which is not in the paper, I'm happy to talk about it. But um, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Dan. You were <laughs> precisely in the, the 30 minute uh, time frame. So thank you for that also. Uh, now we can proceed with the Q&A part. So the participants are free to make comments, uh, ask questions. Unfortunately, we've lost some of the audience due to uh, this uh, time delay. So I guess um, there are fewer of, fewer of us left. We have Julieta. Uh, I, I suggest we collect the questions first and then you can answer all together if that's fine with you, Dan. Sure. 
so I may need to write them down. So. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll type them. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Julieta. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I find it really stimulating, and I I kind of agree with the um, with many of your points. So uh, my questions would be more of a clarify clarificatory nature. Sure. The first one was when you are um, when you were saying when you were exploring the Kelsenian approach and you were arriving to the idea of the staged inquiry. So to yeah. first understand what it is, so to see um, if it's good or you said that it was better to start um, exploring the function of the thing to arrive to what the thing is. But wouldn't this be another type of a staged inquiry? This is my first question. Okay. And my, in my second question, which is very quick, uh, when you were trying to analyze how good the sociological method was, uh, one of the, the second question, the second question, the second problem was about diversity. And you said that the problem was that um, the observer was also putting themselves in the thing that they were observing but i think in my knowledge of in my scarce knowledge of sociology i think that that's a, a thing that sociologists uh starting with bourdieu uh try to resolve so it's a thing that it's not about uh, the the problem of uh law in itself or trying to apply the sociological method to law but in general i yeah can you tell us a little more about that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julieta. We also have Mina. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Actually, it's not a question. I would like you to, if you can elaborate to the last slide more, and if we have time to talk about it. Sure. <laughs> and if I can add to it uh, just a few things. Um, I would like to hear a bit more uh, about the arguments which those proponents of that uh, um, priority of philosophy view have, because I'm not certain when I think about this relationship between uh, facts or the empirical inquiry in general, and on the other hand, the conceptual analysis. Uh, it seems to me that it's quite absurd to uh, somehow uh, make such a clear distinction as to say this functions completely separately uh, because it seems to me that uh, in this epistemological sense we're always moving uh, in a circular way meaning that concepts always have to have um, some sort of an empirical basis because I, I cannot imagine some sort of a ex nihilo concept I mean uh, and I I would like to hear a bit more about the counter arguments on that, uh, starting from the, the basic premise that everything just um, has to begin with uh, our senses and uh, something which comes externally. Um, uh, secondly, I'm I'm curious as to whether when you were talking about the concepts of concepts, um, you, you've mentioned the abstract ones and uh, the abstract view and uh, mental representations. Uh, could we draw uh, some sort of a parallel with um, the distinction between uh, embodied and disembodied representations? I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but if you can just touch upon on that question also. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. My turn. Okay, so uh, thank you very much about uh, for all these questions. Um, so Julieta, first, hi. Um, first, uh, is the functional approach that I'm uh, advocating a stage inquiry, uh, uh, just a different approach, uh, way of, of stage inquiry? Well, um, I I'm not advocating stage inquiry. Uh, sorry, a functional approach. I am saying. Um, it is possible that uh, people's um, thinking about what counts as democracy, for example, um, is um, is um, based on their thinking about what. So, oh no, I'll, I'll restart. So, 
Um, I'm not saying that that um, some kind of stage inquiry is not possible. I'm saying the particular stage inquiry that we are proposed, that we're offered here, that we're presented with here, is uh, mistaken. Now, um, with respect to, for example, democracy, let's take democracy. So. Um, I think, and this kind of touches on, on Sava's point, that, that the way philosophers are, are, are doing it, they're kind of moving between the two. So, so it's not a stage inquiry. So it's, I said, if there is a sense in which we're starting with something, um, it is um, from an understanding of what democracy is for, to, from, to, from which we derive and conclude what democracy is. But the truth is that it's, there's always a kind of movement between the two. So, so it's not really a stage inquiry. I kind of said, uh, and, and if, and maybe I should even this little concession I should remove to avoid misunderstanding in the paper. But, but my impression is that um, that that's how it's done. That no one uh, uh, starts from just saying, "Oh, democracy is," uh, and here is the necessary sufficient uh, criteria for democracy, and then we'll we move to the question: Is it a good? Is democracy a good thing or not? Um, so, so, so that's, um, so that's, I hope answers this. Um, the question of diversity and, and what socio and, and sociologists um, trying to avoid these questions of bias. Yeah, of course, the, these are in, in all debates about social science, one of the, um, or methodology of all social sciences, one of the biggest questions uh, is the problem of, um, of, author or, or scholar's bias. Uh, of course, it's, it's true to be, to be fair, and it's a question debated in all of science, not in the natural sciences as well, but it's more obvious in the context of, of the social sciences. Um, so there is work of this uh, uh, in the context of um, um, sociology, but, but in all others. Um, I would, add that um, um, you might say, well, there is a, a bit of a testing of the way of, of the possibility that what the philosophers is, is legal philosopher is saying is not, um, is unrepresentative or biased because ultimately we, uh, or when the legal philosopher writes their work, um, Others read it and say, yeah, that, that sounds right to me or not. So there is some kind of testing. The problem here is that the community that tests the hypothesis, so to speak, is not representative. It's the community of other legal philosophers. So we can't really, so at one level, I'll say, uh, they're really not representative of the general population. Uh, but at another level, I, I, I'd say, and this is the point of diversity, that even in this tiny world, we see that there are different views. So we have Hart, and we have Dworkin, and we have Finnis, and, and they are, uh, in one way, saying your account of, uh, if, if you're giving, if you're purporting to give an account of people's self-understandings, well, that doesn't fit my self-understanding, right? So, so Dworkin is not just observing uh, when he's presenting his views, he's also reflecting his self-understanding. Now, it is possible that Dworkin is, you know, there's in, in the whole world, there's 10 Dworkinians, maybe. But A, we don't know this until we, we test this. B, we know that um, there are in fact quite a lot of people that read Dworkin and, and felt, oh, that actually reflects, Dworkin did capture something important about law. And the third thing, even people who may have not thought about this before may have read Dworkin and said, you know, that's a good way of thinking about law. It's a better way of thinking about law. And this is my point about this is not wishful thinking. This is the way in which these sorts of arguments about what law is can change people's attitudes. And because, these concepts are reflexive or interactive, that may have an impact on the way people think about law. And of course, if it turns out that 
there are some Dworkinians out there, then the question is, well, what do we do about them? What if it turns out that, I don't know, let's say I'm really making this up, 10% or 20% of the population is Dworkinian and the rest is not. Um, well, so, so, so what do we say? That these 20% are wrong? They just don't understand what law is? So, so, so these are exactly the kind of questions that you have to address once you realize that people's self-understanding, that's the term that, that Dixon uses, um, and, and the one that Raz uses, um, that they are not all the same, right? So, so that's, that's a question you can't avoid. And again, that they are avoided because going back to my sort of my, my general point, these are debate questions that are debated uh, by philosophers of science and social science, but because of the disconnect between legal philosophy and, and philosophy of social science, they're ignored. Okay, my last my, my last slide. So uh, did work in a show or, or is it um, the case that um, Hart and Dixon and Raz are all ultimately Dworkinians? Um, so I have a, a different paper, uh, not published, called the, the uh, in which I, I basically say yes, that that's the case. Um, and so I say there are two, ultimately two views out there, not three. There is the the naturalistic views, which say the methods for the the methods humans are not special, and. The, therefore, the methods we use to explain all the world from the tiniest microscopic uh, or even subatomic particles to the most distant and, and largest galaxies don't suddenly need a, we don't suddenly need a new approach or method for explaining when we get to humans. I hope it's obvious that, that that's my view. So, so that, that's, uh, and there are people who say, no, actually, um, when we come to explaining human behavior or human action, we have to adopt a different methodology. And the main argument that I see being offered is this idea of that human action is meaningful and you can't have a naturalistic explanation. The methods of, of science or the naturalistic methods break down when it comes to questions of meaning. And that, of course, was Hart's view. Hart explicitly says, the methods of the empirical science are useless. That's his word. When we're talking about, um, when we're coming to explain normative human behavior. I use this so many times now, I can give you the exact citation if you don't believe me. Essays in Jurisprudence and Philosophy, page 13. Look it up. He says this explicitly. And, what, and he says also, what we need instead is a hermeneutic approach. Well, what is hermeneutic? What's another word for inter hermeneutic? Interpretive. It's simply that. So Hart, in a way, already saying, yes, I'm doing interpretation. Um, and and so, so to me, that puts him in the same ballpark as Dworkin. Now, let's say a little bit more about this. What is Dworkin's view in a nutshell? Three steps what he calls the pre-interpretive stage, the interpretive stage, and the post-interpretive stage. Pre-interpretive stage, we start, we look, we take the practice. We observe sort of what kind of, yeah, we, we, we say, okay, this is the practice we're, we're looking at. That's a pre-interpretive stage. That's a plain, of, plain level of understanding what we're talking about. Um, this is what Hart does when he says in early on in the concept of law, we start with, with standard understanding of the educated man on, or educated person. Uh, um, uh, we, we, we start with that. This is the pre-interpretive stage. Okay, we then need to put those in order. We need to explicate what actually is underlying, right? That's this whole idea that we saw in my, that Hart says it's it, people have certain con legal concepts, but they don't know what exactly they are. So then we need to kind of do a bit of theorizing to understand what's, what's, what, what explains their, their, their linguistic distinctions. That's the interpretive stage. Um, and finally, in the last stage of the analysis, we 
the, what Dworkin called the post-interpretive stage, we can then go back to some of the observations and claims that people have made at the first stage of analysis and say, this one is right, this one is wrong, right? So, so that's where we kind of use the interpretation that we created to pass judgment on some of the observations that we make. Oh, um, you know, you think this is law, but it's not. Once again, you see this in Hart. So after Hart does this interpretation of what the educated person thinks, um, he he takes the extra step and can say, oh, you know, natural law is, is mistaken because people's understanding is that unjust law is law. People take this view, right, for example. Uh, in fact, he's, what he says exactly about this is a little bit more complicated, but that's the general outline. And I would say Dixon does exactly the same thing um, and and therefore, that's interpretation. Now, there may be some squabble there, internal squabble between Hart and Dworkin about the extent to which this practice, this interpretivist method, requires moral judgment. Dworkin says yes, Hart say, says no. Um, but even, let's assume, let's take this at face value, let's not debate now who's right on this question or not. But even that, if you, that's all right, that's kind of an internal dispute among interpretivists, just like there are many disputes among natural lawyers, there are many disputes among legal positivists. We still consider them all legal positivists or natural lawyers. So here, it's a dispute among interpretivists, but it does not mean that Hart is engaged in something radically different from what Dworkin is doing. And so the real alternative to Dworkin and Hart and Raz is the naturalistic approach. Because all of them, Dworkin and Raz and Hart, are all insistent that the methods of science are, are inappropriate for explaining um, human institutions. And the naturalistic approach says, no, the method is perfectly fine for explaining that. So that's the big divide. And on this big divide, Hart and Dworkin are on the same side. That's my view. Okay. Now, um, so you see, I kind of smuggled in another paper of mine <laughs> in response to questions. Now, uh, Sava, your question. So we're moving in a circle, so the view seems to be impossible. Well, you know, you're kind of here at least preaching to the choir. I agree with you, but um, but there are people who, who disagree with you. That, so Kelsen, I think, is actually quite clear about this. When he says, my theory is pure. He's damn serious about this. There's no sociology in, in my account, he says. There's no psychology. There's no attitudes. I'm analyzing. That's why he distinguishes between subjective and objective, right? The subjective is what people think. I'm giving you the objective concept of law. Um, and again, this is and this is something I kind of I'm not not at all an expert on neo-Kantian. Uh, <laughs> philosophy of the late 19th century, but I did read a little bit about this. And, and then when you read that, you see um, that um, you kind of say, oh, it's exactly what Kelsen was saying uh, in, in general philosophy. You know, what, you know here's the advantage of, of doing um, presentations in this way, because I can share my screen now again, and I'll show an article not by me, uh, but that I found at least very helpful. Uh, it doesn't, okay, so this is the article, Neocantinism, the Root of Anti-Psychologism, British Journal of History, doesn't mention Kelsen, okay? But it does talk about exactly the context. If you're interested, I at least found this article very helpful. And I'm telling you, if you read this, you'll find, oh, that's just Kelsen. Like so many things, at least for me, I said, oh, that's that what Kelsen said about law you, you find in, in more general. So, so that for me is a, it was a, a very helpful uh, article for this. Uh, British Journal for the Philosophy, History of Philosophy 2005. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, as I said, I don't think this view is possible, but, but you know, there are people out there who believe it. Embodied and disembodied representation. I think that's a very important point in general. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't think that's the one. So, so I think, I've again sort of come to read more about embodied cognition, and I think it's an important idea that 
legal philosophers are only beginning to start looking at and and you know should look more into um but i don't think um and and maybe you are uh but i don't think the 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 concepts as mental representation versus concepts as abstract uh entities uh or abstract object as the embodied in this i think it's a different distinction so um so I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, if you think of concepts as mental representations, you may think our mental representations are embodied, right? So, and, and therefore you cannot understand. So, so the embodied, disembodied, if you want, is an internal to the mental representation view rather than, okay. like I said. Okay, okay, yeah. Thank you, I understood that. Uh, if I could just uh, have a follow-up on, sure. on Hart and Kelsen. Um, I, uh, it's interesting to me that uh, Hart refuted all sorts of methodological naturalization when it comes to human behavior and in general law, as we speak of it, uh, since I would say that his theory, his uh, um, uh, uh, basic norm, I mean, his, uh, uh, sorry, my brain just stopped, uh, rule of recognition, uh, it, it's it's based on on empirical evidence, or in that methodological sense, I would say that from the normative perspective, if you want to look at the uh, internal perspective and the acceptance of uh, uh, secondary rules, the rule of recognition, uh, you need to look at facts. I mean, sociologically speaking, and isn't that in a way um, not congruent with uh, this refutation? Okay, good, good question. So, of course, the view that Hart was a naturalist is, is one that there are people out there who say it. I should say that I once even said this. I no longer think it's true. Uh, Leiter is, is a big proponent of this view, um, but he's not. I, I, I have now, I've now have come to be quite firm on this idea. Um, and now, um, but he's a different kind of anti-naturalist from Kelsen. If you want, you know, the distinction has its problems, but, but Kelsen is a more of a substantive anti-naturalist, whereas Hart is a more, is, is a methodological anti-naturalist. So Hart would say, yes, my uh, account is based on people's attitudes, but the way to investigate people's attitudes is not to employ the methods of social science. Um, and you would say, why would you say that? Well, uh, one level at one level, I can tell you, uh, give you a history of ideas answer, which is the environment in which he's um, active. And you know, there is, for example, there is an, an interview that I'm sure many of you have read between Hart and David Sugarman, and he says there, I was very um, skeptical or distrustful, I think that's where he is. They're distrustful of sociology or the social sciences, that's the Oxford disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's an attitude that existed at, in, at Oxford at the time uh, and that just thought very lowly of, of the social sciences. And I actually read him and other legal ph uh, philosophers at Oxford at the time as saying, Ordinary language philosophy or philosophy properly done is the right way of doing sociology. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of introspective sociology. Mm -hmm. um, that's my um, my claim. So, so I admit, I agree that Hart is less extreme, if you want, uh, anti-naturalist than Kelsen. But the, the remark, and this is important for me to say, uh, about his anti-naturalism, about, sorry, the methods of the empirical sciences being useless is not a one-off. Once you start looking at it, uh, he makes lots of other remarks in that, of, of that kind. Um, I'll give you one, 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 one example of this. So back in the 50s, there was a view that was very popular um, that distinguished between causal explanation and reason-based explanation. Mm -hmm. And it says causal explanation is the proper explanation for the natural world. Reason explanation is the, pro is the proper method for explaining human action. Mm -hmm. And this view 
is found in uh, among philosophers of history and, and and actually also in Hart's Hart and Honoré's uh, causation of the law. So they in the beginning there's a philosophical discussion of causation, and they say the scientific concept of causation is not the right one for understanding human human causation. Mm -hmm. In the concept of law, he has a remark about the distinction between reasons and causes. Uh, in 1963, if you want a little bit of, again of context, Donald Davidson publishes his very famous article, Actions, uh, uh, Action Causes and Events, I think that's the title, um, and um, in which he criticizes this view. And one of the article or the sources or representatives of the view that he criticizes is heart and honor accusation of the law. So Donald Davis cites heart and honor for the view that he considers mistaken. And what's the view that he argues for, Donald Davidson? Reasons mm -hmm. are causes. Mm -hmm. So so um, so that's the that's the context uh, that Hart is uh, is working in. And I can tell you, so I was at a conference in which I presented a paper where I cited this line from from um, Hart about um, uh, the methods of empirical science are useless. And Brian Leiter was in the audience and he didn't like the comment, obviously, because he wants to sell this idea that, that Hart was a naturalist. So he said, oh, you know, it's a one-off remark. It's not. It's a remark that's entirely consistent with everything that he says throughout his work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I collected at least 10 other, or I don't know, 10, but eight, 10, I don't know how many exactly examples from, from his earliest work until this essays in jurisprudence of philosophy in 1983, because that's the introduction that he wrote in 1983 for this idea. So mm -hmm. if you want another point here is to say, if you're a naturalist, um, I'm not sure Hart is your friend. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just interesting because the, 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 the question of normativity in Hart is quite complex. And when it comes to, to the matter of the internal perspective of the officials, it seems to me that Hart doesn't go into detail uh, what the reasons for action are, why they have accepted it. But on the other hand, if you want to determine uh, whether or not something is the role of recognition, you have to observe the society. So it, it I don't know, it pushes me towards some sort of a methodological naturalization saying, yeah. yes, we need empirical facts for that. You so, know? so I should say there are people who, who say, oh, what Hart was doing was, was you know, preliminary to naturalism. So uh, it, there's a group of scholars in Italy, um, Corrado et al., I'll call them. And they published an article recently in which they say, you know, here's some naturalistic jurisprudence and we're just following what Hart was, do what was, was doing. Um, you know, like I said, I, I think, I, I mean, this putting aside whether their findings are correct or not, which I'm not passing any, I mean, they may well be correct. I'm not doubting that. I'm just saying, you know, I'm yeah. not entirely sure Hart would, would, would have been your friend uh, or yeah. would have been happy to read your, your paper or, or endorse it. Uh, so, so. I see also Jules uh, uh, doesn't agree with me. So <laughs> please, Jules, go ahead. So I think that in some sense, um, so I agree more with Dan in the sense of I think that even when you talk about the internal point of view and this critical attitude, critical reflexive attitude, you are introducing from the beginning a heuristic approach to the facts that you need to have to see the facts. This is something that also um, Ras follows. So mm -hmm. I think that that's the reason why he couldn't really be held as a true naturalist in this sense, as Dan was um, was explaining, at least this is the way I always read uh, Hart, especially because, for example, you have the Scandinavian legal realists, Oliver Krona, for example, that he yes. departs from. He explicitly says that you have to depart. Uh, you have to depart from language, but without assuming anything. 
And this mm -hmm. is the way, for example, and this was my, my next question then, if you had already considered this, because he explicitly says that you have to depart from the linguistic facts, like what the people are saying, to avoid the problem of circularity on the one hand, and then to not um, to avoid the possibility of the theorist um, reflecting uh, herself in the observations, yeah. because you mm -hmm. depart from that, and then you can. This is absolutely compatible with the philosophy of ordinary language in the sense of you depart from that. But the the problem is that the problem. Uh, I think that the difference is that. In ordinary language uh, philosophy, you depart from that, but you arrive to that. You're just trying to make it um, explicit what is implicit. And then in, I, at least in how I read uh, Oliver Krona's methodology, for example, you can absolutely not arrive to the same point in the sense of the concept that you are using as a, as a theorist is not necessarily and generally is completely different to the concept of the participants because of mm -hmm. this because mm -hmm. you are not compromised by those kind of assumptions you are not using yeah. some heuristic things yeah. a priori heurist heuristic things i'm so sorry it's too late my english <laughs> is uh, all over the place sure. um and then this uh, makes you as a theorist to arrive to the conclusion that you can describe the situation considering and departing from what the participants think about the situation mm -hmm. with different concepts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will. I agree completely. And I'll add just one more word or name. Bentham. Yeah. Bentham well, is, yeah. so, you know, one of the fun, funny, interesting things is about how Hart turned Bentham into an ordinary language philosopher. And he emphasized this idea that, you know, Hart, Bentham was, was obsessed with the analysis of language and so on. But it's for a totally different reason. Hart, the point of Bentham was to say, I aim to look behind the language. Um, and, and so Bentham is, is, to me, perhaps, you know, Hobbes also, the, the first naturalistic jurisprudence. Because he says exactly, I don't care about how lawyers classify. I, I despise, right? He hated lawyers. And so he says, I'm not going to let them decide for me uh, what law is. I'm, I'm going to employ my methodology. Um, so, so, you know, uh, the, the, I have no doubt, I'll put it this way, that if Bentham uh, were alive in the 20th century, he would not have seeing those who speak on his on, on his behalf and, and and as as you know reflecting his own views he he would have said no no you're you know you're you're completely misunderstanding me uh he would have been much happier with with posner uh than with than with Hart. so just again just to say that these issues are not kind of you know again i'll share my screen for one second not again not to show my work uh <laughs> but just to show you um an example of to show that you know these debates are still ongoing. So, so here's a book published, Oxford University Press, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, Interpretive Social Science and Anti-Naturalist Approach. So, um, so, so, I'm, the anti-naturalists who are interpretivists still exist. My point is, that's where Hart is. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, he, he's part of that approach, not of the one that um, that you know people like Leiter are now trying to put him in the, the naturalistic. Because he's exactly again, again, he calls his project hermeneutic, which mm -hmm. is really just another word for interpretive. Mm -hmm. He says the methods of empirical science are useless. He distinguishes between causation and reasons, causes and, and reasons. So yeah. Yeah, Jules, yeah. Yeah, just a finger of, of this, I was trying to remember. I think that Finis in the first chapter of Natural Law and Natural Rights, yeah. he says explicitly that his methodology is heuristic because of a bunch of reasons. But I think that he also refers to Hart in some sense, yeah. in the sense of saying, I am following Hart's footsteps. 
in this. You cannot really understand the thing yeah. without blah, 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 blah. And obviously, and okay, this goes back to something that I asked you about the function. Because for example, yeah. Finis as a explicit terroristic and, and naturalist um, uh, method, uh, yeah, methodologist, yeah. yeah, exactly. He says that you have to have the point of the practice yeah. to understand it or the function of the thing to understand it. Yeah. How do you reconcile this with the okay. naturalistic approach? Okay. So uh, first, uh, yeah, Finnis. So, so Finnis is Natural Law, Natural Rights is an interesting book in the sense that um, it, it's published, I think, as an attempt to kind of to be working sort of still within the Oxford approach. But then, interestingly, if you look at the second edition, which is just reflections, right? He doesn't change the main text, but he adds reflections. He says there, the book is is normative or political and, and should be read as such. So, so I think by the second edition, and this is in his comments on the first chapter, um, Finn is, is kind of saying, oh, if you thought I'm just doing conceptual analysis, that's at least how I read him. You, you got me wrong, I'm not. My project was, was normative from the start. So, and maybe I would say that maybe this was uh, not entirely clear even to Finnis himself back in 1980 because he was still kind of influenced by the Oxford way of thinking um, uh, or maybe tried to kind of bring his project within that. So, so that's kind of less important. That's more, you know, Finnis exegesis. Now, on the matter of how um, you know naturalism or not naturalism, so in a way I want to say I don't. So Finnis says, "Oh, to understand um, law, you need to understand its point." I say, I don't know in a way how people understand law. I suspect that some of them understand it this way. Maybe some don't. Maybe some don't have a functional understanding of law, but I'm saying, please don't tell me that these are people's self-understandings and you base those self-understanding on yourself because uh, there are many people out there. I, I Yeah, one, one thing I should say, I, it was in my slides, it's not in the paper also, but it's in my slides, I didn't, I skipped this, but I'll say it now. Um, philosophers, I'll put it this way, have a tendency to think that people, many people care or are interested or have elaborate views on issues uh, that they don't. So there are all kinds of empirical studies about what people know about the very found basic, basic questions of, you know, the structure of government and so on. And people's levels uh, of ignorance is astounding. So, you know, you ask, I think the one example that to me is the most striking that I remember, people in the US were asked to name, not to explain, to name the three branches of government. And I think uh, maybe half could name them. So, so yes, I, it's, it's really low. <laughs> so, so, so then when people start, so when Hart then says, oh, you know, people's self-understanding of law is that they distinguish between duty imposing rules and power conferring rules. And this is why Kelsen's account well, that reduces power conferring rules to duty imposing rules is mistaken because it doesn't capture people's self understanding. Um, and this is a claim that, that Dixon reiterates and says, yes, you see Hart was right about this. I say, how do you know this and why do you think people have views on whether law is duty imposing or duty imposing and also power conferring. My estimate is that a lot of people have zero attitudes about these issues. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Dan, uh, for this great presentation and lecture and also everyone for the discussion. Um, we've uh just exceeded the time limit so it was i think 
worth it. It was excellent. Um, we will actually uh, delay our uh, following lecture, which is to be given by uh, Julieta. It's not going to be on the next Monday, but we'll email everyone uh, as to the concrete date. So uh, once again, Dane, thank you for coming and being with us. Uh, I hope to see you again soon. Right. So I just thank you. Thank you all for your questions and comments. As I said, I put in my um, in, in the chat. So if you have any questions, thoughts, suggestions or criticisms or anything else, if you want uh, to hear more about the other stuff that was not in the paper that I talked about or anything else, uh, you have my email. I'm, I'm happy to to uh, to continue this conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for coming. We'll be in okay. touch. Great. Bye, okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Done. Bye.